Hi, I'm Brett Pickford, and this is a day in the life of a captain at South Metro Fire Rescue. Aerial medic response. Hey, we work on fire against heavy smoke from the little train and stand Broadway. Go ahead and uh, upgrade the car. Copy. We've got uh, four buildings involved in this time. Uh, collapse on three of them, and second alarm. Second alarm. We have a Q34, tower 45. Engine 42, engine 14, engine 44, engine 15, medic 34, medic 44, district 1, battalion chief 2, safety 18, med con off 14, second alarm structure fire. Yeah, so uh, when we come in in the morning, the first thing we do is, is meet with our counterpart. So as a captain, I meet with the offgoing lieutenant or captain that I'm um, taking over from. And so they have a pass down. We have a logbook in the uh, officer's quarters that they document what they did throughout the day, any anomalies that, that occurred or anything out of the norm that uh, we need to know about. They let us know about calls, anything that's up with the apparatus. So we have quite a few here. If there's any issues, then they pass that down to us if there's anything we need to follow up with. That's kind of our pass down process is, is to get get information from them so we're not losing things in translation from A to B to C shift. And if I delegate something to you know one of the crews, making sure it gets followed back up with when I'm back here at work. Um, I get to see each officer about once a week. And so just making sure if, if they have any issues or they need anything from me that I'm taking care of that. And then same thing with their crews. If, if there's any needs or anything projects we're working on, it that gives me time to touch base with them in the morning, but either before I go home or before they go home to, uh, to make sure that's all taken care of. So once we, once we do pass down, we get all of our uh, personal protective equipment and all of our gear on the, uh, the rigs. So we'll, we'll get all that on and uh, check our air packs, check our tools, check uh, both rigs and make sure we're not missing any equipment and make sure we don't need to you know, go down to fleet or anything to get any repairs taken care of. So that's our priority is make sure the ladders are all functional, um, set up the way we want them, that the, the tower ladders work in, you know, the, the fire pump, lights, all that sort of stuff. So once that's done, you know, we check our EMS equipment as well, and then we'll go in, start breakfast. Um, I'll have a morning meeting while the, the crews are, are cooking breakfast with the other officers in our battalion. So. Um, we're battalion three, so there's multiple other firehouses in, in our battalion that will get on a conference call. The chief goes over anything that he's he's got from the four day. And then um, like we went over the operational meeting minutes this, this uh, tour, and then any questions that anybody has. And then he kind of goes through and asks what our plans are for the day. And if same sort of thing we talked about with the other officers, he asked out of us if we have any needs and kind of sets his expectations. They're doing the day in the life of Brent Pickford. Scary. <laughs> day in the life of Superman. Huh. Yeah, right. <laughs> We're just well, Brad, I couldn't think of a better captain to do that with, so congratulations. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it, Chief. Thank you. Sure. We're First out. Oh, well. Yeah, I feel like you have That's a hard time with it. Oh, oh, really? Yeah, I was good. Even yeah, if I wasn't in the locker, we making the cover all an option, not a requirement. Okay. So right now, you know, the mandate is we'll support coveralls on every medical call. Oh, Going up to Marshall's up by Costco. Take a left in Yosemite. <coughs> yeah, we can for now. Let's see. Yeah, reaction to blood pressure meds. Does it say what the reaction is? No, it's a lift driver having a reaction to his BP meds. So left here? Yep, left. Three, four, dispatch. And BP then uh, right, so just what? underneath the highway. Tower 34. So 
Switch your matter, going to the parking lot of Marshall. The station's going to be in a green for correction gold Toyota Highlander. 54 year old male, conscious and breathing reaction to this new medication. 34 copies. It's not this light, the next one will take a right. Glove second light will take a right. What's up? And then uh, just take that second entrance. It'll be easier. Just park out a lot. Fortunate enough, today we've got uh, three on the medic and four on the tower, and Eric's riding with us today as our PIO, so the medic gets pretty tight. So on a lot of these calls that are not a critical call per se, then some of it, somebody usually stays outside and just kind of makes sure everything's good outside and kind of for safety as well. So critical calls, it gets pretty tight back there. Yep. So the first thing I'll do is you know talk to the medic. I want to make sure the car is clear and. Um, get a kind of the big picture view make sure you know in a house that somebody's standing back and that's usually the officer unless you know they're the only medic on scene or something but that officer's usually standing back making sure the other rooms are clear in the house and that there's no other hazards and then kind of help helping that crew you know between relaying information between the patient and family members and kind of that conduit to you know let them know what's going on too so if there's you know a family member that's there sometimes you need to get them removed from the scene just to get better patient care so that there's not as much, uh, you know, involvement so that we can also get a history from them too. And it helps sometimes to just get them away from the scene if it's if it's real involved so that they can calm down a little bit too. And then uh, the more information we can get from them, then you can give that information to the medics and help them with that so they get the bigger picture. Um, there's a gas line cut that came out while we were going on this call right when we got here so you're kind of listening to that too as far as if a fire drops and this you know they only need two people on this call then we would cut and go to the other call and prioritize you know what's needed so yeah we're always standing back you know radio kind of listen to that in the background no matter what call because something else could be going on or there might be somebody else involved here that we don't know about or PDs involved and we're trying to listen to what they're they have going on as well for sure so as we're approaching, just kind of look at that parapet on the Charlie side there versus, you know, going on the Delta side. Yeah. You know, at least right there. So we're just getting a rep in. Uh, Strachan's doing his task book for his engineer portion, or for the tower portion. So just getting a rep in where they send us to the roof. So he'll set up the bottom and usually we'd have bunker pants on. Right now we have our ladder belts on anytime the ladder's moving we want to be secured in in case it starts uh, moving or we hit something which is not predicted but just for safety. So he's gonna get us to the roof and as we talked about in the cab we're looking at what parapets there are and where the best spot for him to uh, position is to get us on the roof so when we get up there we don't have to use our parapet ladder if possible this one we're probably going to have to but there's different positioning to go to the roof versus a rescue so for the guys doing their task books for training um, that's what the task book is is anybody through the engineer academy that wants to be an engineer has to go through this process so ryan's working on that today he's got so many reps that he's got to do for setting up the the truck and then go into the roof as well so that's one of them uh, the reasons we'd go to the roof would be to investigate uh, 
kind of get an overall view of what's going on if, if we're gonna do a, a roof ventilation or um, kind of see what the conditions are up here. So our first objective would be to do a, a roof report. And so we'd give that to command to let them know what the conditions are before we get on the roof to make it. And then, you know, if we're gonna request for vertical ventilation, we're basically painting that picture for them of what we see up here, the type of roof. Um, you know, if it's flat or pitched, if there's any firewalls, any loads that we're looking at. So as we look out over the roof, we see all the HVAC units. So if, if the crew's working in the, you know, Bravo Charlie corner, we can let them know there's, you know, skylights above them if we need that for ventilation. There's HVAC units to be aware of, you know, especially if that roof's sagging or if we see anything that's, that's critical. How close do you think you are right there? Yeah, so you're fully extended and your left corner of the bucket is actually hanging over the parapet by maybe an inch. If, uh, yeah, if right about inch, yeah. flush to an inch over. So I'd, I'd feel comfortable with that uh, getting off the roof on that left side. There's just a little bit of a void on the, the middle of it. But uh, if we need to use the, the ladder, we'd probably want to position a little bit more to the left, which we have room. So we could do that, and on this roof, we're definitely going to want to use a, the parapet ladder. It's probably six to eight feet, like we thought from the ground. Got it. Westbound University off ramp. Medic 34, engine 33, tower 34, and PA with the known Take everybody else up with the exception of the medic. Copy, continue in medic 34. Yeah. All our units can pick up. They're Great. picking engine us up. And there's a physical fitness standard um, from the department, which is really nice and it helps keep people stay on track. And so, for me, um, I feel like if you, if you stay ready, you never have to get ready. And so that's my part of that is physical fitness. I uh, graduated from Colorado State University with a degree in health and exercise science. And so that's been part of my culture growing up playing sports and with my kids in sports of trying to pass that down to them. And I try to do the same thing here at work is, you know, I've, I've been pretty fortunate to stay healthy throughout my career and I attribute a lot of that to injury prevention and physical fitness. And a lot of that attributes, you know, to the fire ground. If you're healthy and you're in shape, um, you're able to do more work and you're able to, you know, stay healthy and, and not get injured and have somebody else that needs to take care of you on the fire ground to add to the problems that we're already trying to solve. So, hey. This is the part of our day where we get all of our food. So we ate breakfast at the firehouse this morning. So. We usually pick up breakfast for that incoming shift the the tour before that way we're all ready to go in the morning and then we'll buy dinner for tonight and then breakfast for tomorrow and then the crew the medic crew will buy dinner tomorrow night and then breakfast for that next shift coming in so we don't have to go to the store that morning so we usually just rotate who, who cooks and today we're just gonna get some Papa Murphy's pizza and make it easy so sometimes it can be tough trying to find time to sit down and cook so sometimes the easier the meal the better depending on how much you know training we have planned or what the day looks like so we'll see how the rest of the day goes but at least we now have some food if we get busy this afternoon that's a good dinner <laughs> see if we can make it back to the truck without dropping them Tower 34, lockout non-emergent. Well, we got a lockout, so it's uh, usually somebody locks their keys in their cars. It's not emergent, so there's no kid or dog in the car. So we'll head over there and 
get the car unlocked for them and make sure everybody's okay. So it's right over by the Sky Ridge Hospital, so not too far from here. What are we looking for, Cap? White Hyundai. Said it's near the Air Life hangar, so we'll see. Is it even pushing? Yeah, it's a little bit. Yeah. So Patty, you got the lock about right here. I want to go much more. Yeah, I don't. No, I don't know if the car is. If the battery in the car is dead, or if those are dead. Well, we just changed these. I put brand new ones in this morning. Oh man. That might be a security key or a security I'm latch. If it is. Are you able to pull it, Patty? He's hitting the button. But Can you go up and then go straight back towards you? Keep going back. Yeah, you're on it there. There you go. <gasps> Got you. Good job. So, her car battery is dead, so not usually the case. Usually you can just get in and push the unlock button, but this one, her battery is dead, so we had to just pull the unlock button or pull the button and got it open but some of the newer cars are all electric and they don't have that so her key was messed up from somebody trying to break into her car in the past so her key didn't work in her door either so we were looking at going under the hood and just trying to pop that cable to do like the hood release but it was behind the radiator so we couldn't do that so luckily Patrick was able to get it with our lockout tool and that worked worked pretty good so now she's in working with our engineers doing his engineer task book uh, earlier we had him go to the roof on a commercial building and now we're working on more of the depth perception uh, with a couple props we have set up on the roof for the tower to try to get to. We've tied a kettlebell with some webbing to the bucket and then we have some five gallon buckets on the roof that you'll see that the goal is for him to put the kettlebell inside the bucket and kind of judge that depth perception so he knows how far he's extending out and then work on lowering or raising to, to get it in there and make the fine tuning adjustments at the end. At the station, there's two other officers. So we're on C shift, A and B shift um, are the other two here. And so there's two other officers that I manage and um, coordinate to get projects done at the station and to make sure everything's working appropriately if, if there's something that needs to be done, delegating tasks to them and their crews. And then making sure that the culture in the station is, is good with them and their crews as well. So if there's an issue with uh, personnel then we try to handle that before it goes to you know the battalion chief level or um, up above that to try to just take care of it so really driving that culture in the station and setting expectations for the other two shifts of here's how we're going to run things you know at this station also at 34s we have the technical rescue team is based out of here so i'm the technical rescue team coordinator so there's a big part of that that i manage with the rest of the team so there's about 50 um, personnel that are on the tech rescue team and so I manage um, them and then I also delegate tasks for the team so one of my lieutenants uh, Joe Sims he's in charge of more of the education portion of it um, some of the uh, video capturing things like that uh, some of the apparatus stuff and my other lieutenant Rick Peterson is in charge of the training so he coordinates the calendar for trainings uh, we have a tech rescue academy coming up and he's pretty crucial with doing a lot of stuff for that and organizing that with, uh, we work with Castle Rock Fire for our Tech Rescue Academy. So collaborating with other agencies and um, making sure that everything gets done with that. So Tech Rescue has um, multiple disciplines. There's confined space, trench rescue, building collapse, vehicle extrication and rope rescue that en encompass Tech Rescue. So then there's five discipline leads and, and SM subject matter experts all within those categories that I lean upon for for those monthly trainings that we do. So, it's quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of work. Um, it's very fun and rewarding, and I enjoy doing it. So for 
Firehouse 34, there's anywhere from usually eight to 10 people. So just trying to do stuff that's easy to cook and doesn't take a long time. A lot of times I personally go get like Costco ribs and smoke those, those aren't too bad. Do the pot pies from there too, it's really good. And then, well sometimes we'll end up going out, so if we get busy, then we'll, we'll end up going to get mod pizza or go to a local restaurant. And uh, yeah, just try to figure out what people like and try to stay away from odd type foods that <laughs> not everybody would enjoy, I guess. Last time we got pizza, we were a little short, so gotta make sure we get enough this time. We got five pizzas for, I don't know, six, six people. So <laughs> Everybody almost gets their own pizza. <laughs> Don't wanna be that guy that shorted the crew of food. They'll never hear the end of that one. Have you ever shorted the crew of food before? No, but you can ask one of the guys here how that went. <laughs> Good. Dinner's ready, dinner's ready, come and get it. You know, life happens at, at the firehouse table, and so that's certainly the center point of any firehouse. You probably got to see our firehouse table. That's the pride we had in it. We had guys here in the past that took an old trench panel and made you know our logo out of it and did an epoxy table years ago, and so that's still with us today. So that's part of that culture that you see in every firehouse. And so, you know, dinner, we, we solve all the world's problems, or at least create a few in the process. I know I really wanted to go back for more pizza. Yeah, so we just had a, uh, came in as an MVA and it ended up being a lady ended up hitting a, a doe, a little deer here. And she, I guess she said a dog or two was chasing it and she avoided the dog and ended up hitting the deer. So Lone Tree showed up and they're gonna handle the situation. They'll probably end up euthanizing the deer because obviously it's not able to walk at all. So there's nothing really we can do for that, so. A big part of, of what we do, and we don't always realize it because we love what we do, is um, you know we're away from our family quite a bit, and so just trying to stay connected with them uh, during COVID was was extremely tough because uh, all the added pressures and and everything else going on, you know, all the different uniforms and PPE you had to, to put on and things you had to do and worry about uh, were part of it. But at the same time, you weren't allowed to have family, you know, at the station, and so. Uh, within the last month, we've we've lifted that since the restrictions have lifted, and uh, families have been allowed to to come over. So the crews that were working, you know, Christmas and Easter and Fourth of July, all the big holidays where your families usually come to the firehouse, that wasn't happening. And and so I I think uh, people don't realize that side of it. They just see you know watching these videos, they see the calls we go on. Oh, that's really cool, but it's it really is a commitment. Um, from your family too to make sure that they support you and you know you miss out on, on lots of life and so the department's 
good at supporting us, you know, with vacation and, and good, great benefits so that we can, you know, get to go on vacations with our family and, and spend that time with them. And so I, I try to um, tell the guys and girls that, you know, make that a priority. And it's that work-life balance that a lot of people don't see. So if you're thinking of getting into the fire service, whether you have a family or not, just plan on that down the road that, you know, it's that work-life balance of making sure that you have a, a good, long, healthy career, but you're taking care of your family at the same time. And it's not always easy to, to balance that. And so the families are the people that are behind us that truly support us and uh, we really appreciate them. So we couldn't do what we do without our wives and kids and moms and dads and family. So we're pretty fortunate with that. Usually sit down, do more reports, watch TV, unwind for the day and then uh, you know it's time for bed so we work 48 96 so two days on four days off so then you know last night we were fortunate enough not to get any calls so i don't have a bunch of bags under my eyes and i'm not exhausted um so we just we try to make sure that we uh take care of our firefighters if we get calls in the night then we'll try to sleep in a little bit to make sure that we're rested and ready for the next call and if if not we can we can take a nap, you know, that second day so that we're, we're rested and ready, you know, for that call. That's our priority. And so we want to make sure we're taking care of ourselves. So then we get up this morning and kind of start all over again. Crews are in there making breakfast right now. And uh, that's, that's pretty much the day, you know, a general day. Obviously, things change throughout the day and flexibility is huge as a firefighter because you may not get to eat breakfast and then it's you don't get to eat till you know afternoon you might not get to eat till dinner you know unless they have food on scene from you know red cross or somebody goes and picks up food so you just got to stay flexible and always have something in the truck ready for you too so that you're you're prepared if, if that comes down